Maybe somebody will join us, who knows? Last, well, I have to apologize that last week I got blown offline um, while I was broadcasting from um, Sammy's. And so I think in the future on the Sammy's evenings, we're going to have to just say it's going to be republished as a, as a um, upload and not be broadcast live because it keeps going in and out. And that, and that's not good. I mean, it just, it just is too distracting. Yeah. Anyway, I un unmuted you for the moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, you... that was a very good session. I really enjoyed uh, tuning into the rebroadcast uh, after mm -hmm. your at Sammy's inter very interesting discussion. Yeah, it got it, it. It did get interesting, and all these discussions are interesting. It, they help people. Um, to see that they're not alone in the world in terms of their understanding of things. And, you know, maybe the traditional understandings need to be revisited because, <laughs> because what Sheffer is saying, I think it, it, the, pronunciation, the pronunciation of his name is Sheffer, although because it's got umlaut A in it, but anybody can tell me what is the correct, correct pronunciation. Um, but uh, basically, he, he starts his article by saying that New Newtonian physics is kaput since the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, I think there are a lot of Newtonian physicists that are, <laughs> that are thinking, uh, um, you know, rumors of my death are exaggerated or whatever it was that, that Mark Twain said. Well, and in fact, you know, although I'm no longer practicing, uh, for a period I was a professional engineer, and it, is, Newto yeah. it is Newtonian physics that uh, we design structures by. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that is... Uh, and will continue to be the case somehow. I don't think we're going to, you know, the quantum part of it uh, is, you know, maybe true at the quantum level, but uh, we can't live on uh, quarks alone or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, on potentialities. We have to live on actual things. Uh, okay, Tim, let me try to let you in here. Uh, allow to talk and promote to panelists. There you are. Hello, Nancy. Hey, Miles, how are you doing? Very good. Okay. So now I think we have Tim here, although he's temporarily muted. I'm gonna unmute him from my end. Hello, hello. Hi, Tim. Hello, Tim. Good to see you. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about this esoteric quantum physics stuff. I've been reading the book, uh, Sheffer's book. And, uh, you know, we, we all were taught E equals MC squared. Well, Sheffer's got a little addition to that, which is E equals MC squared equals potentiality. Uh, and uh, so that's interesting. Um, so I think what I'll do is uh, I will read the, ah, we have Jerome. So welcome, Jerome. Hi, Good. Jerome. The gang's yeah. getting all here. Um, okay, I'm just going to very briefly read uh, the abstract again, which is 10 lines of this paper. And the paper was put in the Dropbox for uh, two weeks ago. And it... Um, 
and I sent it to all the panelists again. Um, so everybody should have access to this uh, paper. And so just to remind us where the paper is, and then we'll go to where we left off last time. Uh, we describe similarities in the ontology of quantum physics and of Carl Gustav Jung's psychology. In spite of the fact that physics and psychology are usually considered as unrelated, in the last century, both of these disciplines have led at the same time to revolutionary changes in the Western understanding of the cosmic order. Discovering a non-empirical realm of the universe that doesn't consist of material things, but of forms. These forms are real, even though they are invisible, because they have the potential to appear in the empirical world and act in it. We present arguments that force us to believe that the empirical world is an emanation out of a cosmic realm of potentiality whose forms can appear as physical structures in the external world and as archetypal concepts in our mind. Accordingly, the evolution of life now appears no longer as a process of adaptation of species to their environment, but as the adaptation of minds to increasingly complex forms that exist in the cosmic potentiality. The cosmic connection means that the human mind is the mystical mind. Okay. And so then we were on page four and I'll just read what he says about ETs, which is entities. Uh, hi Art, welcome, nice to see you. Um, in Infinite Potential, this is the book I've been reading also. This phenomenon has been described in the following way. At the foundation of the visible world, we find entities which always appear to us as elementary things when we interact with them. However, when they are on their own, they become waves. As waves, they have lost all mass and they have become pure forms, patterns of information something mind-like and thought-like. Accordingly, we can call the units of existence at the foundation of the world ETs, meaning elementary things or uh, of ele oh, elementary things of elementary thoughts or simply entities. Being a localized material particle in one state of existence of an ET, being a non-material wave is another, as it turns out, the wave state is the preferred state of an ET. It is the home where it will go when it is left alone. As a wave, an ET has lost all of its mass. Uh, it, it has become a non-material and invisible form. And since waves are extended in space, it has no specific position in space, but many potential positions. We say that an ET in its wave state is in a state of potentiality. Since material per particles, whenever we see one, always appear with a specific mass at a specific point in space, we must, complete, we must conclude that the ETs in a state of potentiality aren't a part of the empirical world. By making a transition into a wave state, an ET leaves the empirical world. Okay, any comments up till now? <laughs> Can anybody follow that? <laughs> I, I know how I have explained it in Jungian psychology, which is that the archetypal potential is like a dry stream bed and it just sits there and it doesn't do anything unless you put life in it. But when you put life through that stream, then whatever the archetype is that's being constellated then comes into life, whether, you know, whether it's the warrior archetype or the mother archetype or um, any other archetype that might've been identified. 
So anyway, he goes on now, and now I'm starting new material. This phenomenon is general and cosmic. There is a realm of the universe that we can't see. It is a background of non-material forms, not things. The forms are real, even though they are invisible, because they have the potential to appear in the empirical world and act in it. In fact, we must now think that the entire visible world is an emanation out of a non-empirical cosmic background, which is the primary reality, while the emanated world is secondary. And so, I don't know, I guess this um, relates to the cosmic background that we can see back to now with the Big Bang and you know we have a picture of what that looks like and um, that these potentials act together and gradually they create planets and stars and things anyway going on hearing no objection <laughs> we can't really know what the nature of the ets is in the non-empirical background of the world. Indications are that they have wave-like properties. If so, we must think that the background of the visible world is like an ocean. The ETs in this ocean are hanging together like the water waves in an ocean do, so that the nature of reality is that of an indivisible wholeness. Now, this reminded me of a famous quote that Debbie and I like from David Bohm, who's, who was a physicist. I think he's dead now, but he, we like this sort of snippet of a quote, which is unbroken wholeness in constant flowing motion, which is the wholeness of the cosmic background. And so going on, the whole wholeness of the cosmic background is also suggested by the following consideration. If the ETs in the realm of potentiality wouldn't form a co coherent whole, the empirical world that is emanating out of the com cosmic potentiality would be chaotic. However, the visible isn't chaotic. Rather, it always appears to us as a coherent system. So, okay. Everybody's. <laughs> One of the ways I think about this, I'm a, I'm a visual person, so I, I'm always looking for visual ways of understanding things. And I think about the wave in the ocean being something solid in our world, like a human being. Mm -hmm. And you follow it by, by watching the motion of the wave go across the surface. But the particle, is the molecule of water that rises up and down with each passage of the wave, just like the molecules in our body are moving through the earth over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's really helpful to, to think in terms of, you know, the, the wave has a character and a form in the real world but it can't be best described by material things. It can best be described by just following it through time. Yeah. Now, Debbie, as it happens, sent me a photograph of light as both particle and wave. Now, I don't know why this is particle, but anyway, this is supposed to be the first ever photograph of a particle and a wave at the same time. Now the light particle and wave. Now, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced. It looks very wavy to me. Um, but people, scientists at the EPFL, whatever that is, have succeeded in capturing the first ever snapshot of this dual behavior. So quantum mechanics, in this article it says, 
quantum mechanics tells us that light can behave simultaneously as a particle or a wave. However, there has never been an experiment able to capture both natures of light at the same time. The closest we have come is seeing either wave or particle, but always at different times, taking a radically different experimental approach. EPFL scientists have now been able to take the first ever snapshot of light behaving both as wave and as particle. The breakthrough uh, work is published in Nature Communications. When UV light hits a metal surface, it causes an emission of electrons. Einstein explained this photoelectric effect by proposing that light thought to only be a wave is also a stream of particles, even though a variety of experiments have successfully observed both the particle and wave-like behaviors of light, they've never been able to observe both at the same time. Um, a research team led by Fabrizio Carbone at EPFL has now carried out an experiment with a clever twist using electrons to image light. The researchers have captured for the first time ever a single sna snapshot of light behaving simultaneously as both a wave and a stream of particles. The experiment is set up like this. A pulse of laser light is fired at a tiny metallic nanowire. The laser adds energy to the charged particles in the nanowire, causing them to vibrate. Light travels along this tiny wire in two possible directions, like cars on a highway. When waves traveling in opposite directions meet each other, they form a new wave that looks like it is standing in place. Here, the standing wave becomes the source of light for the experiment radiating around the nanowire. This is where the experiment's trick comes in. The scientists shot a stream of electrons close to the nanowire, using them to image the standing wave of light. <clears throat> As the electrons interacted with the confined light on the nanowire, they either sped up or slowed down using the ultra fast microscope to image the position where this change in speed occurred. Carbone's team could now visualize the standing wave, which acts as a fingerprint of the wave nature of light. Well, this combination shows that the wave like nature of light, if simultaneously de demonstrated its particle aspect as well as the electron passes close to the standing wave of light, they hit the light's particles, the photons. As mentioned above, this affects their speed, making them move faster or slower. The change in speed appears as an exchange of energy packets, quanta, between electrons and photons. The very occurrence of these energy pack packets shows that the light on the nanowire behaves as a particle. Okay, well, once again, I will show you this picture and you may be convinced I'm, it looks pretty wavy to me, but um, there it is. It reminds me of a light spectrum, you know, yeah. like you, a prism, you, you take a ray of light in a prism and it makes it a little rainbow colors like sure. that. So right. uh, I'm not sure exactly what they're trying to say about all this, except I'm not either. Uh, it's you would have to get into that field pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and I, and we're not trying to do that here. So uh, no, I, I think we're just trying to. Uh, what you're saying is to trying to relate this to uh, what Young psychology. Was, yeah, yeah. What Young was saying in the Unis Mundus. Uh, is that the source of uh, everything that we receive in our cells, little cells, is coming from some other uh, source, which could be probably, if you think about it, maybe a wave or something like that. Well, and it's also not physically present necessarily. In other words, you know, the warrior archetype isn't present or isn't constellated in a young man 
until he has to go to war, okay, <laughs> or until he's trained to go to war, or whatever, yeah, you know, or you know, a young woman is doesn't have the mother archetype constellated until she's impregnated. But when she's impregnated, then it's there in, in full force. And uh, only Nancy can tell us the truth of that. Is that true, Nancy? Once you're a mother, you're a mother? Well, it's, yes, it's quite a wonderful and amazing experience. <laughs> well, and you know, I think being a warrior also is an amazing experience, having going through it personally, I can say that, you know, it definitely does constellate and it makes you a certain way in life, but then you have to come out of that archetype at some point. If you're going to live your life, that's the question. How do you come out of it? <clears throat> um, it's kind of like you complete your archetype. And there's different, yes. different ones. Uh, so you right, and that stops. that was my experience too. That that once an archetype stops, it plays all the way through. It has right. certain yeah. features to it. It plays through, and you can't stop it until it's done. It's like a letter on, or a, a disc on a jukebox. Once it starts playing, you're not going to stop it until it's. Uh, played all the way through and then once it's played through then you're done yeah you're really you're really kind of seized by it in other words so it right. is kind of a, some people call it a possession but i wouldn't go that far but i mean you could right. but uh, so i'll uh, um i'll chime in getting with respect to the physics and uh, just jumping back to what you read at the start is it said that at the foundation of the visible world, we find entities which always appear to us as elementary things mm -hmm. when we interact with them. So that's the particle concept. And, and so we are each in our physical being, uh, these physical particles all connected up and working together and um, so it's telling us that the particles that we're made up of, these entities can also be waves. Um, so I've got my textbook from my engineering studies, mechanics for engineers, statics and dynamics. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it basically says, yes, when we look at the world as Newtonian particles, you know, there's all sorts of formulas and wonderful things to design beams and springs and gears and levers and such. So that's your physical particle Newtonian world. Right. And I'm, it just occurred to me that it goes on to say, if the ETs, the uh, elementary things in the realm of potentiality wouldn't, would not form a coherent whole, the empirical world that is emanating out of the cosmic potentiality would be chaotic. Right. So interesting. It so it's suggesting that this physical particle world emanated from, you know, the cosmic potentiality, right. and and it is coherent. <clears throat> so thinking of how um, these wonderful engineers can design an artificial heart, somewhat functionally, but mm -hmm. a long, long way from being perfected. Uh, from what I know, you know, there's, they've done some marvelous work in trying to create a, a replacement for the heart. But when we think about it, you know, how are we, how could we possibly um, bring together the materials like creator did to create that heart yeah, how, that's, that's... with the, <clears throat> That's the question. So, so we have an interesting conversation going on in the chat here on YouTube. So let me just uh, read through some of this also. Uh, Winston's mom says, good evening, gentlemen, and the one lovely lady. Quantum physics tonight. Interesting. Brian Green's video on string theory. 
is a good representation of ni, ni, I guess, uh, in my opinion, elementary, my dear Watson. Okay, I don't know, what, does anybody know what ni is? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, just shows my ignorance here. Einstein on the train observing the clock tower. I believe that is when his observation about time and light first came to light, yes. And uh, Opal says hi, and then Winston's mom goes on. Cosmic Hole, Schrodinger, Schrodinger uh, you are a part, a piece of an eternal infinite being, an aspect of modification of it. MIT is doing vibration experiments on water crystals. Metal music makes water mad. Uh, interesting, speaking of Schrodinger, I did look up Schrodinger's cat just before uh, this session. Uh, is anybody familiar with the term Schrodinger's cat? It's a thought experiment that he- I hope he's still alive. Uh, <laughs> Tim knows. <laughs> I don't, I don't think he is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seems doubtful, right? <laughs> uh, but basically, the idea was that Schrodinger's cat could put, be put in a metal box and hit at one, what, one atom could be hooked up to an apparatus that if the atom degraded in a period of time, the cat would be dead, but if it didn't degrade, the cat would be alive. But the problem is once you open that box, I think you have a dead cat as far as I can tell. Yeah, but anyway. Well, you don't know until you open the box. Well, you don't know until you open the box and uh, you can't do it in real life because the poor cat would, would uh, suffocate and and also cats have other aspects which would cause it to die over a period of time <laughs> besides that one atom. Um, so anyway, Winston's mom goes on, hi Opal Sparkles. And does anyone remember the light bright, bright toy or game? Light bright toy or game, I don't remember it. Opal. Yes, I do. And what? tell us about it. Well, it's a very, um, I, it wasn't, I didn't actually have the game. We, we bought it for our kids and uh, the, you do have to pick up a lot of pieces. It's just a, it's just a, uh, it's a bunch of plastic pieces, pegs that you put into a, uh, like a pegboard, but behind the pegboard is light. So if you, you have these multiple colored plastic pegs and putting them into the peg board with the light behind it, you can create these lighted images of whatever you want. You know, you can use your creativity to put the pegs and the colored pegs in to create a flower and the lit up from behind. So. Okay, uh, there's a question here. What lab was this photo taken at? and it is EPFL. They don't specify more than that, but this article, uh, which is the name of the article is the first ever photograph of light as both a particle and a wave. Uh, here it is. It's, uh, it's EPFL is a abbreviation for a French name, Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. Okay, so it's, it's a polytech Polytechnical School in Lausanne, Switzerland, EPFL. And so that's what it is. Um, I'd just like to finish up with what I was starting to tell you about, and that is, okay, so you, we have our heart in our chest, mir miracle that it is pumping for, you know, hopefully we might live a hundred years pumping 70 times a minute, roughly, uh, flawlessly for 100 years. And it's an incredible pump moving gosh knows how many millions of liters um, over our lifetime. And, um, and that, that 
pump will eventually fail. And what we're reading and learning is that it's actually, as Einstein said, matter is neither created nor destroyed. Uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's just transformed. So Dr. Lanza, I forget his first name, but he I shared a link where I, he states that death is an illusion. So that heart of ours, our entire body system of particles will turn into these waves. So off they go, right? Um, so death is an illusion. Physical death is an illusion. Now going to psychologically, um, what does that mean to us? So if we're just if we're just existing on this physical planet and you know maybe just going through the motions of mechanical living um, and not you know going to depth from the ego to this God image, um, that's sort of a that's sort of just like staying in the particle world and never moving into the wave, right? Is that what we're getting at here, maybe? No, because, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's sort of like staying in the particle world. Okay, so by the way, there's this conversation going on on the MBTI on the, on the YouTube chat. And um, one piece of advice here, which uh, Jerome could comment on is uh, one of the, one of our members here is advising the other uh, not to let anybody know what your type is because that might be giving up too much too much information. <laughs> who, who is saying that? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Winston's mom said, "Yes, I understand. I made the mistake of telling everyone and trying to talk about Jungian typology. Be careful with who you share." your new interest, and I am only half kidding. Uh, do you notice water? Um, oh, I also see where she said the NI that you've talked about is, yeah. is referring to uh, in, in, the introverted intuition, yeah. which is a uh, subset, which is actually the introverted intuition is a perception function. In other words, there are two perception functions. There's uh, sensing mm -hmm. you know, around the world, and there's intuition, right. uh, which is a hunch. Or you, you kind of put these, what we're talking about is you kind of put what's out there that's not there, and it comes together all of a sudden. Yeah. So that's yeah. an intuition or a hunch. And the introverted intuition uh, is means that you more or less your hunch comes from inside uh, in your physical self. Extroverted right. intuition is something you see in the outside and you see objects and you get a hunch about those. So they come from two different places. Right. Uh, the the yeah. sensing comes from, from actually physically seeing something. Well, sensing, yeah, we did. Yeah, sensing is just the, uh, well, you can also have introverted sensing. In other words, somebody can sense something in their body and they may uh, not equate it to something that they ate. They might equate it to something else, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's all uh, mixed up. But anyway, uh, what she was referring to was uh, the intuition. I don't know why it, people would mind sharing their type with people, except that sometimes people I've noticed online are using their types to claim uh, they're better than somebody else or whatever, you know, it's just, it's right. a kind of a warring game they go about and fight with each other. But which, which is basically silly because all of them can be uh, useful at one time or another. And not only that, but we all use all the types at one time or another. It's not. Uh, well, we, we tend to have a, a, a primary <clears throat> type <clears throat> function and we really should develop that first mm -hmm. and uh, the other functions will develop as you mature yeah well uh, there's uh, there's a book for laymen called people types and tiger stripes uh, yeah. so if you're interested in learning more about it and you're 
just yeah. getting into it, you could look at that. And please understand me by Kersey mm -hmm. uh, is a good one. Right. And uh, I would, you know, so well, since I'm kind of prejudiced against MVTI, since I've been doing it for about 40 years. You're prejudiced against it? No, I, I, no, I am. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of talking about it, because I know a lot about it, in other words. So. Okay. Well. Probably uh, the wrong word. Yeah. Pardon? Probably the wrong word, but, you know, I'm just familiar with it. Uh, but but you suggest you have a bias against the MBTI, is that what you're saying? Oh, no. No, no okay, because I misunderstood wrong. what you said. Oh, okay. um, well, um, what I would say is that I, you know, I was never formally trained as an NTI, M MBTI trainer like Jerome was. Uh, so I only got the one day course, I don't know, six or seven different times from the US military. Uh, but what I did find by getting that course is it helped me interact with other people in my group uh, all the time. Okay, it always helped me understand uh, something about people. And Help me out here. What's what's the MPTI? Is that the Myers Briggs Myers Briggs Type Indicator, which oh, is uh, MBTI, okay. and and it was. I think, Jerem, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the founders of MBTI was like a granddaughter of Young. Is that right? No, that, I think they're just Ismail uh, Myers and her daughter. Uh, oh, okay. To, and uh, it was developed from uh, Young's psychological types. Uh, right. And yeah. you, I would suggest you read Young's psychological types because I'm more uh, favorable to that. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but they did develop this and it has been validated uh, and used by many uh, companies, uh, education systems, uh, religious yeah. groups, uh, it has a wide usage and it, yeah. it really helps in terms of running groups in that you learn that each person processes information a little bit differently. Yeah. And you get, you get better results when yeah. you consider perspectives from different perspectives. Right. And you can learn to communicate with someone, uh, as I said, you're not talking ships in the night passing, but you can at least try to understand uh, the way that one person perceives it may be a little bit different from yours and you compare notes. So right. uh, I think Winston's mom said something. Yeah. All right, she's, well, anyway. Yeah, intuition is pattern recognition. Uh, she mentions about the intuition. Yeah. Uh, and what we're talking about is the archetypal is a pattern sitting back there ready to activate if something happens. Right. And you can see that if you step off a curve, you don't even think about it. You catch yourself. You, if you had to think about it, you'd fall on your face. You know, so we have all these patterns ready and waiting, like you were saying, just mm -hmm. ready for something, a trigger to cause it to activate. So right. anyway, right. that's right okay so let's not get further into mbti tonight because that's not tonight's topic but um okay let me go on here as patterns of information the ets in the realm of potentiality are more thought-like than thing-like thoughts usually appear in a conscious mind thus the appearance of thought-like forms in the cosmic potentiality suggests the consciousness that consciousness is a cosmic property the universe is conscious of our thinking is the thinking of the cosmic mind which means consciousness in us which finds consciousness in us um and i think um you know this was uh what's his name uh, Well, anyway, there, there's a number of things about consciousness on YouTube uh, where, you can, where you can find that 
that consciousness came first, not, uh, not material things. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, even one iron atom or one hydrogen atom is in some sense conscious of the next hydrogen atom because somehow they hold together and they, they make a larger ball of hydrogen. And that's true of all uh, elements. So, I mean, it's not consciousness the way we think of consciousness, but it's in some way it's awareness, I would say. Did you, did you have a comment, Jerome? I re, I'm thinking that that um, merges with the idea of gravity, that objects in different parts of the universe somehow have an attraction to each other. And it seems like that is a similar kind of relationship right. that we're talking about here. Right. That doesn't depend on the speed of light. It is it is beyond that physical limitation. Right. And and what cosmologists have discovered in the last 60, 70 years is that the universe is actually expanding faster than the speed of light. Um, and um, you know it, it's I don't know. In other words, it should have expanded 13.5 billion light years back to the Big Bang. That should be the distance. But the reality of the distance across the universe is something like 46 billion light years. Uh, so, um, so it's obviously expanding faster than the speed of light. Um, so anyway, it goes on. The same conclusions follow from the holistic nature of reality. For example, in their book, The Conscious Universe, Kafatos and Nadu have argued that if the universe is an indivisible wholeness, everything comes out of this wholeness and everything belongs to it, including our own consciousness. Thus, consciousness is a cosmic property. This quantum view of the holistic reality is in perfect agreement with one of Jung's most important seminal ideas, that is, the archetypal idea of Unus Mundus, which Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz derived from characteristic medieval views of the world. In Jung's words, quote, this comes from Mysterium Conjunctionis, paragraph 767, Undoubtedly, the idea of the unus mundus is founded on the assumption that the multiplicity of the empirical world rests on an underlying unity, and that not two or more fundamentally different worlds exist side by side or are mingled with one another. Rather, everything divided and different belongs to one and the same world, which is not the world of sense. Uh, so that's an interesting idea. Well, that's kind of like the play of opposites is what, what they're kind of saying here is what I'm trying to get at other than, uh, you know, in string theory, there's parallel universes. Mm -hmm. So as to how those would be, because uh, they say they don't exist side by side or mingled with one another. But uh, I think what he's really trying to say is that uh, if you look at that, there is a cosmic, uh, for more, I'm going to jump ahead. <laughs> there's, there's everything. <laughs> a cosmic for everything. And we're mm -hmm. part of that, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of like the ocean and the wave. We're all part of that. Kind of, kind of like God, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent and. Omniscient. Uh, yeah omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent and uh, omnipresent everywhere. Yeah, you got yeah. It. yeah, the three O's. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a vision one time that might illustrate this a little bit. And it was of a, 
an oval shaped object with little cells throughout. And the object itself was God and in each cell was a little bee. And each bee was exactly the perfect aspect of God that was intended. Right, I think we're actually um, going to have that in this essay because there's a, and my Buddhist meditation group has been talking about it. And I think there's a reference in this essay to a Hindu way of talking about it, which is um, if you take a large pot and you let the sun reflect in the large pot, pot then there's the sun reflecting, right? But if you take a hundred small pots and have water in all of them, the sun reflects in its completeness in every one of those pots, right? So it, it's not separated, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wonder like in every cell, since you're the host, I'll use you as an example, in every cell in your body, is there a skip? Just yeah. like a little pot of water, a big I, I pot think, of water to I, the little I think pots. biologists would say yes, that you have DNA in every cell of your body. And then they supposedly have cloned, you know, different uh, sentient beings. I'm not sure that I think that's a good idea, however. Well, but if you, if you, if you clone, from the same material, okay, there's, there's still gonna be different beings. They're not gonna have a, exactly the same thoughts at the exact moment, because once you've separated from your clone, let's say, different things start to happen to you, okay? So it's inevitable that you're gonna be different. All right, so going on, um, I'm going to go on with this. Ontologically, this archetype means that there is a reality that must be united, apparently divided, opposed, but beyond the illusion of matter, it is one. The reader will note the agreement of Jung's views with the quantum view of the world that we have described above. The process of individuation is an innate capacity of the individual to become aware of the self. According to Robert Casey Foreman, we have an innate capacity, which is an imperative light, long life process of transformation. This is an impulse to unite what is divided. In the archetypes and the collective unconscious, Jung affirms that I use the term individuation to denote the process by which a person becomes a psychological individual that is a separate indivisible unity or whole. Searching for wholeness would be meaningless in a Newtonian world of separate material things. In the quantum world, it, is, it has found a physical basis. Jung also understood the process of individuation as a religious impulse, which is a wholesome spiritual archetype that directs and coordinates the flow of human life. The word religious is used in this context in the sense of its etymolo et etymological roots in which religare means to reconnect or to be in bond or to reunite. As Aniela Yaffe wrote, quote, Individuation must be understood in religious language as the realization of the godly in the human, as the fulfilling of a godly mission. The conscious experience of life becomes a religious experience. One could just as well say a mystical experience, unquote. Now, what, the way I like to talk about individuation is that when you're born, you're like the acorn that makes the oak tree. And so, um, or when you're conceived, let's say, uh, once you have two cells to you, you're like the acorn that becomes the oak tree. So all oak trees are alike, but 
the capacity to be that specific oak tree in that specific location is something that every living thing strives for, okay, in, a, in its own way, whether it's a rose or it's a oak tree or it's a giraffe or a human being. So the giraffe has all everything in it uh, that to make it not only a giraffe and fit all the qualifications of a giraffe, but also that specific giraffe. And so you have within you, your, within your unconscious, this drive to become the specific human being that you were intended to be. Um, and so that's what I, that's the way I try to explain individuation. Other thoughts? I mean, you keep getting beaten back when you're not doing that. I mean, you have to take it as, you know, if you're going through Job's uh, trials of Job and you, you get beaten back because God's put boils on your skin or whatever it is, <laughs> then, then you have to go a different route and it's a circuitous route. So that's why oak trees have different limbs at different levels and so on. And if a limb gets cut off, then sometimes, you know, a little sprout will come out of that stump of that limb or the oak tree will go and, and have leaves somewhere else. So, so it is with us. Well, I think he, he, he said, uh, Young said it was a religious impulse mm -hmm. or a spiritual impulse, if you want to call it that. And it says to reconnect. So uh, when you're separated uh, from your mother, so to speak, uh, from the womb and everything, and the whole idea is to mature, you have to separate from that. Because right. there is a tendency to go back <laughs> and forth between that. And then as you develop that and you get more, uh, you're trying to fulfill a certain pattern which Jung called individuation, and you have to go through this pattern and steps. And that's the same way as the acorn becomes the oak tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of things that get in the way. So that's what you're talking about, I think. And, yeah, and, and so... But the idea is that we want to reconnect with wholeness, but we're at another level. Right, with what you should be at this time. And right. And so you may be blocked. I mean, I've been blocked any number of times in my life, but um, you know, for the last three and a half years, I've been doing this <laughs> reading group every Monday. <laughs> and so it seems to be a proper use of my wholeness to, to offer this to the world and let people judge for themselves whether it's useful to them. Um, and, uh, you know, since I've already raised my children and or done my worst at raising my children, but they're all pretty good kids. And uh, I now have uh, nine going on 10 grandchildren. Um, I don't have the pressures of raising a family anymore. So I have more freedom to do other sorts of things. Um, and um so well if you don't have those experiences uh young would say you would have an undifferentiated undifferentiated life i can't pronounce it right and well i mean uh, you know you're just kind of just vegetable so to speak in terms yeah. of being undifferentiated so yeah i mean coming up was immediately after world war ii and so uh, we had all these war movies and young men were um, playing war a lot and so on. Certainly we were in my gang. And, um, and so it was a natural thing for me to go in the Marines, but then I get in the Marines and I say, wow, I don't want to live my life with people shooting at me all the time. That doesn't sound like much fun. <laughs> but nonetheless, I did it and I did it in a certain way. And, um, but, but then I decided to become a lawyer and, uh, you know, when you're training, it's like 
a child being trained, you when you're training to be a lawyer, it's just school, 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 right? But then I got out practicing law and I said, wow, I don't want to do this. This is just dealing with other people's hardships all the time. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so here I've decided, I, okay, I don't want to get shot at all the time. And okay, I don't want to deal with other people's hardships. What am I going to do now? Well, I guess I better build a business. So then did that. And so anyway, that's the way it goes though. And so, and then finally you get to the point where you're in your 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Start running out of steam, I guess. Um, but Anthony, Robert so would you say that you know your your issue with staying in the military and shooting at each other is just as Young says, because to be part of a any initiative or enterprise that's shooting at others is definitely not taking you to um, find the whole, to be unis, find the unis mundus, right? Well, it's I, a, I'll it's, tell you at that time, an, I was not thinking about holes. Okay. No, but you, you in, innately or unconsciously, you're thinking this isn't satisfying. You know, you might not have recognized it uh, explicitly, but maybe unconsciously, you're realizing that this is not taking you to find the whole. And then, well, you know, it's well, sort of like it the song. It can be quite painful. It can be quite painful. Physically, um, yes, but just spiritually. I'm talking about spiritually too. I yeah. mean, when, when you, when you, have a marine die in your arms, which I did have. Um, you know, it's uh, it's not spiritually satisfying. And you say, why? You know, why are we doing this? <laughs> and in a sense, you know, we have to ask ourselves: Is our current ec economic uh, paradigm, this uh, system that we live in, is it? Uh, fulfilling or satisfying for those of us in the call, you know, for some people, maybe they're just so focused, like Mr. Bezos is in collecting money that, you know, he's fine with, he's quite satisfied with that. But for others, I think the people, why we come here is because we're searching for something. Well, and well, it was said, if you're on the wrong train, every, every station you come to is the wrong station. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it can be the, the right station at the wrong time, too. You know, like uh, uh, when I got lost in Japan at age 15 in the middle of the night, um, I went two hours into the darkness on an express train and I got off at this train station and that night it wasn't the right station but on another occasion months later i was on that same platform and it was the right station because it was in the middle of a of a um, holiday a matsuri a, um, you know a, an event in japan and so then it was the right station so it's you got to be there at the right time now, we have a couple of comments here. Anthony Roberts says, does anyone else find a strangely beautiful synchronicity that the da Nag Hammadi scriptures were found in the year uh, World War II ended or about that, that time? And Jung received the first codex as a gift. Well, yes, that's an interesting synchronicity. Brother Francis Philip Downing says, uh, in TA or developing out of it, there is a concept of an inner child. I didn't want to know if Jung ever said or alluded to an inner child, inner Christ child, little child. Yes, he most certainly did. <laughs> in fact, uh, the divine child exists uh, in uh, at least the last four um, major books in Jung's oeuvre uh, to include um, uh, Answer to Job, uh, Ion, 
Mysterium conjunctionis, and uh, what else? At least one more. Um, and basically, the idea of that divine child is that the divine child being born in the psyche is also the Christ child in in Christianity is a is a, a, a knowledge that you're connected to something uh, greater than yourself maybe I don't, I don't know and um, and so it's what some Christians refer to as being born again um, and um, You know, in, interesting, I was listening to uh, Jeffrey Mishlove a couple of days ago because somebody told me to listen to a Mishlove, one of Mishlove's uh, videos, and he has a lot of good ones. But uh, in it, he was talking about um, the difference between belief and knowing. And, you know, in, in Christianity, you can either you can believe because somebody told you and gave you a doctrine that you have to believe uh, or you can know. And uh, so his example was uh, talking about the steak dinner he had last night and he can tell you about it and you can, you can believe him that the steak dinner uh, was good for him and that, that, uh, it tasted more or less the way a steak dinner would taste for you, uh, but you don't necessarily know what it what it tasted like until, unless you tasted the same steak, basically. And so, in Christianity, the the divine child is that part of your psyche uh, that does know. I think maybe Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong here. Do you? Um, but, um, I don't know really quite how that works, the divine child, uh, how it comes in from Jung's thinking into the Christianity. I don't quite understand that. Well, it, it, it comes in through the Christ child and through the belief in the Christ child. But as long as you're being taught it in Sunday school and you're... Um, you're just learning the stories, you can believe it, okay? There are plenty of people that believe the Christian story, but when you know is something else, you have, you've had to have tasted it. And, you know, I know you have because we spent hours and hours talking about it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Right. And... Yes, and, and but it seems that it seems like this uh what did they call it? The co the co the cosmic mind or whatever they're referring to there. It seems like and I just call it God, uh seems to be offering uh something to us that is for us to move into our full potential. Right, which is what individuation is about and, and so on. And when, when, when that part takes hold of you, then, then you do know, okay? Then, then, you know, it doesn't matter what any dogma says actually. Uh, and and they're, they're all, just ways of getting to that point. I mean, because it's like the difference between logos and arrows. So you can have all the dogma in the world, but you know, if it if if it doesn't click, um, you're not going to get it. Um, so it's like a. Um, I once asked in Japan at a conference. Uh, you know, what's Zen about? And so the teacher said, well, I can give you two examples. One is typing, where as long as you have to think about where the keys are on your keyboard, uh, you can't type. 
It's only when you can forget about where the keys are, then you know, then you can type. And another example is riding a bicycle. As long <clears throat> as long as you have to think about how to balance and steer um, and, uh, and pedal for propulsion, um, as long as you have to think about those things, um, you can't ride a bicycle. It's only when you get to the point where you can forget about balancing and steering and pedaling that you actually can ride a bicycle. So when you ride a bicycle, you don't think about it. You just know how to do it. When you're sitting at your computer keyboard, you just know how to type out the words. You don't know, you know, very few of us, I think at this point in time, and certainly uh, late at night like this, <laughs> we, there's, there's nobody sitting there hunting and pecking, maybe, you know, maybe a few, but not so many. Um, I'll uh, add a little bit on with respect to what I know of the divine child. And as I said last session, you know, I'm now the theo theologian of myself, psychologist of myself. And people who know me would say, oh, yeah, Miles is definitely born again Christian. But what I now know is uh, you I have to know that I need to be born again and maybe again no, maybe. Um, because I had these blinders on that I would have said, yeah, I'm born again Christian because it's all about Jesus. And it's, you know, it's almost all about Jesus is what I'm now going to say, say here now. And, uh, and, and it's through um, this conversation that we are having and we've had, wherein to think that I have the authority to tell somebody that they don't have salvation and I don't even speak their language, I don't even know, you know their spiritual experiences, for me to say such a thing is again why I award myself the return the nails postcard. Mm -hmm. I, I joke with my, my Buddhist teacher who's, uh, he's now American, he's Tibetan American, uh, but he's a, he's a genuine monk and has been since he was 10 years old or something like that. And um, I joke that in, in Buddhism, there's the, you know, the 37 ways of doing this and the four of this and the 15 of that and the 32 of that. And they keep teaching you all these numbers. And I say, well, but Ribiche, this isn't enlightenment. He says, oh, I agree. <laughs> enlightenment is, is when you can leave those things behind. And, and so it's, it's exactly like dogma. I mean, enlightenment, Sadly, in Buddhism, you know, they have a sort of a doctrine that you're not going to be enlightened until you die, until your death. Um, but I think um, my impression is that you can have a pretty broad uh, lightening up um, long before death, as Dr. Jung did when he had his heart attack in 1944 and had a near-death experience. And mm -hmm. And when he came out of it, he definitely had a different view of life after that for himself. Yeah. I'll just add as well about the divine child. So, you know, I'm always learning and I'm being born again um, on a, on, you know, on occasion, shall we say, I won't say on a regular basis, but on on some occasions i would say i have been so i continue to be like a divine child i would say and that i realize that i'm always needing to learn well and and you can have small and, and great synchronistic experiences um which can have profound influence on your life okay um and and those are maybe mini awakenings or something like that. 
um, that tell you something about yourself and um, so on. I certainly I've had several of those experiences uh, with several of you in terms of different in in different ways um, and um, and so each one of those is a is a new connection with the infinite, the whole, the wholeness of the infinite, in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, you could say there are different awakenings that happen mm -hmm. uh, as you go through. I've been reading the comments about the, they're back to MVTI, unfortunately. But anyway, yeah. well, I um, like Winston, my, Winston's mom's last comment here. Best bumper sticker: My karma ran over your, your dog. <laughs> There you go. That's, that, right. that sums it up right there. So, right. <laughs> but anyway, she was uh, uh, the Marie von Franz talked about the your weakest function is unconscious, uh, which is uh, inferior. Mm -hmm. And so, if you look at the Myers Briggs, uh, the one that's uh, most unconscious, uh, you know, your dominant is very conscious, about seventy percent in your secondary and your tertiary and your uh, fourth one but anyway it's the the window into the divine child is through that unconscious function because it's unconscious and that's where the window opens that's the gateway mm -hmm. to answer uh, winston's mom's question but well that's uh, uh, that's fair enough i think my weakest is probably sensing and it's only when I've gotten into the detail of whether it's Buddhism or uh, Christianity or Jungian psychology, when I, you know, I really break my head trying to understand what's, what's there. And then all of a sudden, boom, I got it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then I got it. <laughs> so anyway, let me read on or we'll we'll still be reading this essay in May. <laughs> uh, okay, another characteristic aspect of Jung's work is his fascination with alchemy and specific, specifically with the philosopher's stone as a metaphor of the process of individuation. Jung considered this process as transformational journey into the wholeness in which we bring the invisible to the visible spiritualize matter and materialize the spiritual. In Septum Simonis Ad Mortuus, The Seven Sermons of the Dead, uh, re republished in the Red Book, he uses the Gnostic term pleroma to refer to the wholeness uh, in agreement with the aspects of wholeness that appear in the quantum view of the universe. Jung believed that the psyche has a natural and innate urge toward wholeness. Henderson has pointed out that, quote, a sense of completeness is achieved through the union of the consciousness with the unconscious contents of the mind. Out of this union arises what Jung called the transcendent function of the psyche by which a man can achieve his highest goal, the full realization of the potential uh, of his individual self. The craving for the wholeness is the real opus that underlies all of Jung's work. In accordance with quantum physics, the meaning and purpose of our nature is anchored in the numinous realm of reality. As Jung describes the spiritual quest, quote, the main interest of my work is not concerned with the treatment of neurosis, but rather with the approach to the numinous. But the fact is that the approach to the numinous is the real therapy. And in as much as you attain to the numinous experience, you are released from the curse of pathology. Even the very disease takes on a numinous character. And so I guess this is, you know, approaching something like the divine child where, um, you know you can get there, you know your kids can get there, so you take them to Sunday school. Um, but 
until they've actually had a numinous experience, um, they, they aren't going to grok it necessarily. And so a lot of young people fall out of Christianity because um, Christianity has lost in, in many churches, I think, especially Protestant churches, um, it's lost the numinosity. Now, maybe uh, Nancy can argue with me on this, that maybe in fundamentalist churches, there's, there's some of the numinosity in the way they're presented. Um, you know, I certainly have been to Well, a at any particular church, uh, there are going to be people who have had an experience mm -hmm. and know. And know, yeah. And they have, they come from very different directions and have very different conclusions, but they have had an experience. Right. So they, uh, so they've had well, a numinous experience. That, I also find that the black churches I've been to are are full of numinosity in in terms of kind of the sensuous experience of praise. Right. They, they just really exude that. Yeah, and you know we've seen it recently in in uh, Elijah Cummings' funeral, for example, but in um, you know in the funeral for the people in South Carolina who were killed by Dylan Roof. Um, you, know, you definitely see that, and and you know I've been in a in a couple of fundamentalist um, churches where you know something happens that you know it's like Billy Graham and his crusade where something grabs you and and makes you uh, a part of that whole I guess. Um, you well, I, th I think uh, Billy Graham and a lot of the great speakers, they're in the pharoma. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in the stream and you're experiencing that stream and that can motivate you to become interested and say, hey, how can I get in that stream? How can I be? In, I, I want a piece of that. Sure. Yeah, I want to be in the stream. And right. but uh, you don't hold on to the guru or whoever it is. You got to learn how to get into your own stream. Yeah, and that's and, right. And as, if you rely on somebody, you're not on the string. You're just tagging along for the ride. So, uh, you know, we need to figure out, uh, based on your particular type and temperament, what is it that uh, you, you can get into that particular string? And that's where Nancy, in terms of her uh, explanation there was there's different types of people and all types of churches and all types of other things or even non-religious get into that uh, stream and uh, you know that is the divine coming coming forth uh, sure and you know I remember it from when I was like 10 years old when uh, my family moved back from Kodiak, where we were in a non-denominational uh, chapel, Navy chapel in Kodiak. But when we came back to Michigan, um, what my father had been Baptist and my mother Lutheran, and they wanted to agree to a church. So they decided they would go to the different services uh, in the community and figure out which one fitted them as a couple better. And um, one day, uh, my, my dad accidentally dropped us off at a Catholic church and didn't realize it until uh, my siblings and I and my mother got out of the car and went into the church. And then he realized it was a Catholic church. And maybe my mother realized it as she was going in the door too. And I remember my brother and I uh, responding to all the icons and statues and things in the church and saying, wow, this is cool, <laughs> you know, because nothing like that in, in Protestant churches or very little. And uh, my, my father, I think my father never came in. Once he realized it was a Catholic church, he never uh, went in, darkened the door, but my mother, 
sat it out, went through the whole mass, and and then she just she and my father said, "Well, we're not going to go to that church." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, wow, why not, you know, and <laughs> uh, not realizing that uh, at that age, I didn't realize that I'm descended from hard-headed Dutchmen who had uh, had come to the New World to escape the 80 years war, uh, which was that lovely war where the Catholics came up from Spain every summer for 80 years to try to beat the Dutch and back into Catholicism. <laughs> and in the middle of that, my ancestors got on a ship and uh, came to New Amsterdam. Um, and, uh, but now we have to go about our, our religious approach in a different way. And so we have to see what what's good and, and not good about all religions and what works and what does give, give us that connection to numinosity. Um, and, you know, for me, believe it or not, it's, it's Jung and Jung's work, but it, it allows me to connect together all of my experiences, which go back through Shinto and Buddhism and Hinduism and you know, Catholicism and, and you name it. And then I can see what they're all doing. And, and so Jung definitely helps me do that. Um, well, I think the, uh, the piece you just read, it said in accordance with quantum physics, the meaning and purpose of our nature is anchored in the numinous realm of reality. And that's what we're, we're trying, we're talking about this numinous realm of reality. Right. And uh, the people that have experienced this, I know Nancy has, and I have, and Skip has, is this, this is the, the numinous is what I've, considered to be the reality so. well definitely tim has too as, and as, tim I, i'm sorry to, you know, <laughs> and as, miles you know. as evidenced by his experience of visitation <laughs> with the muse well that's right yeah that's right uh, <laughs> and uh miles can yeah, speak and i think we're all we are all in agreement i would i believe that the Christian archetype, and the what did you refer to it? This what or what did Jung refer to the was it the stages of the Christian archetype or the you know the big circle of the four? Right, that was yes. actually Edinger that did it, but it Edinger's. was the, the Christian cycle. Um, so yeah, that's a great you know that's a great cycle, and if you can pattern your life or you recognize your life being reflected in that Christian archetypal pattern, you know, great, that's numinous. Mm -hmm. Or you recognize your, the pattern of your life in the Job archetype, you know, yeah. that's numinous. That's, or yeah, that's, that's what got me is because I don't think that pastors or priests or whoever I was talking to over my lifetime ever even really understood this. Okay. In other words, I, I think that very few, I mean, I never remember any lessons on either the book of Job or the book of Revelation. None. Okay. And so I don't think that most you know, bread and butter pastors who have a corner church really understand what, what it is. And, you know, they keep talking about, you know, it's everything's Christ, everything's Christ, but what's Christ? I mean, you know, okay, Christ uh, was an important guy who lived a, a certain life that has been passed down to us because it means something to all of us in all of our lives. And you can call it the Christ within us. That's one metaphor for this thing. But, but it's, you know, Christ knew it himself because 
he said, pick up your cross and follow me. I mean, he even knew this um, in his own lifetime that, that he was living out an archetypal experience. And, and he had, had been touched in a numinous way in some, ha in some way. Uh, well, and all, these, all these scriptures uh, in, in the Bible are just uh, stories of uh, what that numinous event was all about and lessons about human nature and how we have behaved and will continue to behave throughout the eons. Uh, and right. I think uh, well, Nancy in her talk was talking about what I would think is she can add more life to these scriptures because they've kind of become, uh, they need to be reinterpreted for our particular times uh, and add some context to what this means yeah. in today's world and how it can impact us. So, Yeah, so I, I like uh, some of the things that uh, Brother Francis Philip Downing is saying here. Um, did I mean he? I don't know if I've got the whole thing that he said because I'm following, but he says we're all facets of the infinite diamond. And um, Jaguar focus says, well said, light focused out of the different facets of the diamond, absolutely. And Jung did what he, he was put on earth to do, and absolutely, and so did. Jesus, uh, you know, no doubt he did. And uh, what is surprising to me is only to learn, I don't know if I learned this from you, Nancy, or from Edinger, but uh, I started to understand that Jesus was actually intentionally living out an archetypal pattern that had been laid down um, centuries before him. Okay, in other words, um, the, the whole story of him coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, um, that came out of um, um, Ezekiel's vision, I think, or either that or Daniel's vision, somebody's vision, where it was described and and so the whole entry into Jerusalem, he was trying to follow what the prophets had predicted, right? And, and uh, Well, know, there were things too that happened to him that he could not have made happen that uh, fulfilled various scriptures. I can't think of one tonight, but, um, Prophecy was something that was very important in those days, and it still is today, really. Surely. But uh, the book of Matthew in the New Testament is being written to the Jewish people, pulling in a lot of prophecy mm -hmm. from the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures to help the Jews understand who this man was, the Messiah. Yeah. Right, and he, he kept referring to himself as son of man 80 times in the New Testament, which was a concept that came out of Ezekiel's vision, I believe, and Ezekiel's vision had come 500 years earlier or something like that, and uh, what I hadn't realized until recently when I read Edinger's book called The Christian Archetype uh, was that the acquisition of the donkey uh, was predicted um, that he, he told his uh, apostle go into the city and find the man who has a she donkey with a foal and tell that, tell the owner, my mass, his master, my master has need of it. And that was actually a prediction uh, back from the time of Ezekiel, okay? And, and so all Jews would have known it at that time. And so when somebody comes up to you and say, you have a <laughs> she dog yet a, and a foal and, and somebody walk, comes up to you and says, you know, my master has need of it. 
you're going to give up your donkey for that because that was that was a prophecy that was known probably that's the way i took it anyway i don't know if you agree with that but well my own opinion is that jesus knew who he was that he was a fully individuated man mm -hmm. uh, and he was in contact with the cosmic mind as we're talking about it today precisely and he <clears throat> he uh did what he did out of that uh context he wasn't right. trying to put anything over on anybody but he was trying to reveal who he was and who right. we can be. And what, and what he was showing by the experience in Gethsemane is that all of us can have doubts. And even he had doubts in, the, in his three prayers to the Father in Gethsemane. Because if you, if you have doubt, you're not going to do the things you're called to do. Um, and he was called to uh, make his sacrifice. And, you know, all of us, you know, I remember when during the Vietnam War, my sister was trying to get me to desert the Marine Corps and go to Canada. And, and I just remember my reaction to that was, hey, you, you know, I wrote to her and said, you know, I'm a professional soldier here i you know if i hadn't accepted the idea that i might lose my life at this i wouldn't i wouldn't be here and i'm i'm definitely going to keep doing it <laughs> you know <laughs> and that's the same sort of thing you know you have a you have an assurance that that's what you're meant to do and so if you're if you have any doubts don't join the military or you know whatever it is you know do the things you're called to do um and uh and then press on uh i'm sure uh tim for example was called to be an artist and he never looked back i mean when when were you called tim when you were 10 i think you said when you started to work with metal yeah, when I was 10 years old, but I didn't think of it as art. I thought of it as being alive. <laughs> it didn't occur to me till later that that what I was doing was actually an artistic path. Mm -hmm. But then you were, but you were always on that path. Yeah. Right. And so for me, I, I mean, I was always on the path of, of being a Marine without knowing it because you know we were watching all these john wayne movies and you know from here to eternity and all that <laughs> back in those years after world war ii and you know at about the same age you know i you know 10 years after world war ii and and there were a lot of movies about it at that time and my father was a military man a, served a career in the navy and uh so we were you know i was always going in the military and um i was totally floored when when the vietnam war um the, the vietnam war uh, fight between those who didn't want to serve and those who did started i it never occurred to me and even i i went to a what we call a little lefty college <laughs> and uh it isn't that i was i wasn't a right-wing type of guy at all but it it never occurred to me not to serve um and i was the only one i mean ultimately others did serve and several gave up their lives but um i was the only one that got commissioned on graduation day that's for sure um and uh <clears throat> so anyway i mean if you're called like that then then you're gonna do that thing and that's what christ did 
So anyway, going, going on, let's talk about shadow here because the next part of this is shadow. And uh, I think we can get through at least this section. As we have pointed out before, the path of ethos needs a non-empirical domain of reality. This invisible realm, which Jung assumed as psychoid, provides an infinite field for the progress of the ego self axis relation, nurturing consciousness as an element in which every phenomenon collapses. Quantum physics brings us a new kind of reality in which it is our task to unlock our potential and to free us from our ignorance, the biggest shadow of all. In agreement with Jung's analytical psychology, quantum physics provides us with direct suggestions of how we can live in accordance with the numinous realm of the universe. Joseph Campbell has used the metaphor of the hero to describe the process in which the ego unites with the self. In the first half of our life, our ego is separated from our unconscious. However, after this period, it has a longing to reach a primordial state of wholeness facing all kinds of dangers and trials. The Portuguese language has a specific word for this longing, which is saudade. Uh, we find this myth in countless ancient spiritual teachings in the writings of the classical poets, and now it reappears in the worldview of quantum physics. Aniela Yaffe writes, quote, in religious language, an image of a God who seeks man just as much as he is sought by man, God seeks the individual in order to realize himself in his soul and his life. Expressed psychologically, the self requires the ego personality in order to manifest itself. The ego personality requires the self as the origin of its life and its fate. In religious language, this means God needs man just as man needs God. Unquote. As Jung wrote to Eric Neumann, God is a contradiction in terms, therefore he needs man in order to be made one. God is an ailment man has to cure. Okay, any thoughts about that? Well, I just had an experience some months ago uh, about, you know, God wanting us as much as we want God. And I had was talking to a friend of mine, Sister Claire at the Carmelite Monastery, and I said, when I sit in prayer, I just weep with longing. And she said, God sheds tears of longing for you too. And that was uh, deeply meaningful to me, but it represents what we're talking about. Right. And I guess we could ask Brother Francis here, uh, since you're here, um, do, do uh, people who are ordained in the church know that, that this is what they're doing, that they're um, connecting with, with these other dimensions other than simply um, following a a pattern that gets people to be good Catholics. I mean, I, I'm not saying being a good Catholic isn't a good thing. It definitely is a good thing. But, um, you know, there's one thing to um, connect people up th through following a, a formula, uh, which is what the Buddhists do, what others do as well. Um, but how is there consciousness that you're doing the same thing as the Buddhists, as the Hindus, and so on? Uh, That's such a big question. It can't be answered easily. But uh, I would just say that there are many pastors, both men and women, uh, and priests in the Episcopal Church, both men and women, who are very much in touch with what Jerome called the Pleroma, the stream, and that through their lives and their preaching and teaching, other people 
are influenced and come into that stream and experience uh, something more. Uh, there are pastors and priests too who want to do good, to help people, to comfort people, to, to uh, pray with people, to do good deeds, you might say. Right. Uh, so there come, and some, some see it as a business almost in, in the sense of planning to get to a certain size church by a certain age and <laughs> having a certain income. And so you, you have quite a variety of people, but I would say, generally speaking, there are those whose heart is open to God and uh, are a connection for others who are searching. Yeah, and the ones that I've met, Nancy, are, uh, they've actually been called. They, they, they hear a call for it. In other words, they've actually had that call. And what's interesting though, is that uh, I have a cousin who uh, is a minister and he's actually uh, talking to priests uh, or ministers that they're having to get out of the profession because there's uh, the demand has fallen and he has to take them to almost a desensitization process to get them out into the world to think about another career even yes uh, that is happening and uh the large denominational offices have had to trim their budgets dramatically uh, many rural churches in the Catholic Church don't have pastors or they have someone who comes through periodically uh, and does the Mass. So this is happening and we are moving towards a different consciousness. I know I've experienced a tremendous change in consciousness since just this last summer. And when we do come in contact with others who are in the stream and beyond us, it touches our lives and we are transformed. Right. And that, that kind of leads into what Skip was saying about the uh, idea of that, you know, it takes two, it takes both us and it takes God and we have to, we're coming together here and, and that's the kind of what I think is the goal is we're leading towards a, a oneness. Uh, well, and that's, uh, I, th I think that um, consciousness of synchronicity is, is very important in this regard. Um, because, and, you know, when I think about the stages of consciousness, which I talked about in my talk called Finding the Living God. Um, you know, we, we went through a stage in the 20th century where nihilism and, and atheism ran rampant across the whole Western world. And the next stage of consciousness, which seems to be happening because there's even a, um, an article about the Pope getting involved in it. I probably have that here, um, but it, um, it is that we have to, uh, you know, we have people like um, John Verbeke who says, oh, we're not going to go back to those old religions. But the reality is, yes, we are. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going to do because the, the old religions are naturally evolved uh, ways of handling uh, psychic health. And, you know, maybe a lot of pastors didn't understand that's what they were doing, but that's what they were doing. And, and so that's the self, that's God, that's the, that's the three and a half billion year old man who has our back, as it were. And okay, we you know, if you're a Buddhist, you see you see it in a different way than a Hindu might see it, or a, a Taoist might see it, or a, you know, a Christian, a Protestant, or a Catholic, or a Jew, or a Muslim. But the reality is, it's it, they're all pointing back at the same thing. And if we understand that, then we don't have to kill each other about it anymore. 
then we can find out, you know, what are the good things here that, that are in all these traditions that, that we ought to be adopting? I mean, the way I say it is uh, with, with Islam, you know, what's bad about praying five times a day? You know, that's, that's not a bad spiritual practice. <laughs> and, you know, and I'll add, you know, for me, uh, my experience with my indigenous neighbors, what's wrong with a round dance and uh, to the drum, right. which right, symbolizes exactly. Mother Earth's heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Well, these, these are all numinous uh, experiences, and that's how we get in contact. Uh, right. And reconnect with uh, what's important, I think. Right. And so then as I, as I grokked what a synchronous experience is, oh my God, they're happening to me all the time. Uh, you know? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think that they happen to everybody all the time, except that, um, that, uh, most people don't see it uh, or they think of it as uh, they think of it as just a coincidence but it is a meaningful coincidence so it's uh, I can talk about it in the context of the tarot for example where um, the tarot is based on archetypal patterns and and developed over a thousand years time uh, with the major archetypes as the major arcana. And so the tarot cards relate to everyone, okay? And so if you sit in a tarot reading, if I do a reading for you, okay, there, I'm not doing anything that's magic. All I'm doing is doing a reading based on what comes from me um, intuitively. Right. Um, but you will hear not what I'm expecting you to hear, but you will hear certain aspects of it that touch you very deeply. And so the example I give is I could go into an auditorium and I could throw the tarot cards across the stage with a thousand people in the room. And I could do a reading just walking around like a Native American might walk around the stage and just read it off the, off the floor. And everyone in the room would think I had done a reading for them. Why? Because by synchronicity, something in my reading will connect with everyone. Everyone will hear a different reading, even though I, they heard the same words, but when the, you know, when I say something about the empress being mother, for example, so I say mother or high priestess or uh, the magician, if I say something about those cards, um, somebody's going to be impacted by those, um, by those ideas. And there's, there's, uh, if you look at the cards, front and back, I mean, the, uh, the reversed uh, readings of them, you get 158, I think, different possible readings at each point in the layout. And so there's infinite variety in what can come out, but without fail, they'll touch you somehow. Okay, they'll touch you about your life. And and that is synchronicity, that's the synchronicity, but then it can put you in touch with this deeper part of yourself because, because my words reach a, let's call it a sore spot in your psyche or you know, a, a spot in your complex that needs to be uh, further brought into consciousness so that you can work with it. That's the idea of it. And that's what going to church on Sunday does for you, too, because uh, you, you hear a story, the pastor will tell a story and uh, give a reading and so on. And somehow, you know, often that connects 
with you. And, you know, what I was noticing 40 years ago when I was a deacon in the Reformed Church was that I didn't know why, but when I came out of church, I felt better. And the reason was that, you know, things were connecting up in, at the unconscious level. Um, and so anyway, um, all right. Eddington's views of a conscious universe. Now this is Edward Eddington, or um, well, let's see if I can see how long this is. There's a couple of interesting sections here. I don't think I should get into this because this is two pages long, but um, we're on page six of this essay. So we'll keep working on it till Christmas, <laughs> probably. Uh, so the next section is section five, which is Edding Eddington's views of a conscious universe. And um, just to remember that Eddington uh, was the man that went and proved Einstein's theory in um, 1919 or whatever it was after World War I. In other words, he went to the Gambia or someplace to observe an eclipse, which proved that Einstein was correct with his theory of relativity and about space-time. That um, And uh, so he talks here about the conscious universe. So uh, he's an interesting fellow. Any other comments? I should shut up. I can't do all the talking here. I'd like to read something from Jean Shinoda Boland's book, The Tao of Psychology, Synchronicity mm -hmm. and the Self. And uh, we've been talk using different words for this uh, something of unity behind all things. And she says this, um, it seems to me that the Christian vision of the kingdom of God, the Eastern vision of the Tao, Jung's idea of the self and synchronicity, the right hemisphere's intuitive way of perceiving totality and containing opposites, the parapsychological evidence for consciousness separate from brain or body, and the new reality as seen by quantum physics, are all part of the same ineffable, invisible, meaning-giving something. Each is a glimpse from a different vantage point. So, Nancy, would you tell us the name of the book again? Because uh, This is The Tao of Psychology by Jean Shinoda Bowen. Right. Okay. okay. And I'm reading from uh, page 102. All right. That's one I want to get because uh, Jean is... Uh, is one um, who I've followed for many years and who I've had some interesting, at least one interesting experience with, but a couple of interesting experiences. And uh, Nancy, you told us, you told us, or you told me at least, that um, when you met Jean Schneider Boland, she talked to you about the uh, the feminine coming through. I wonder if you'd say something about that. Boy, you know, my my mind is blank at the moment. Uh, if you can talk about something else, I'll see what, right. you, what okay. comes up. Well, um, I'd just like to thank you very much, Nancy, for that. Wow, that's tremendous. That quote you provided us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, the. Um, I was actually talking about it with several women in my uh, Buddhist meditation class this morning. They're all psychologists, or several of them are psychologists. And um, they were they were talking about how, or I started to talk about how the feminine uh, was coming through and how excited Jung was about the Pope um, issuing the papal bull of the assumption of, of the Virgin Mary into heaven in 1950. And they said, oh, that happened way long before 1950. And I said, no, it didn't. 
<laughs> but, but when, um, because, and it was important from Jung's point of view because he, he saw the feminine as the missing fourth uh, from the Trinity. And, um, and of course the church was simply um, recognizing a fact that had been true in the Catholic church for like a thousand years maybe where people had been uh, praying the rosary and uh, the one uh, that sticks in my mind is from the, uh, the movie A Bridge Too Far where a bunch of uh, uh, people who are wounded and in the hospital and there's uh, a fellow there that's praying the rosary and um, and so that would have been before this assumption but anyway the point was that that the feminine of god is coming through the collective unconscious and to the point where it's actually manifesting in something like this papal bull um, and you know, Jung states in answer to Job that he felt it was the most important religious event since the Reformation. And, um, and so that's what came to my mind when I heard you during our interview um, talking about the fact that you'd run into, uh, into Jean Chanot de Bolin at some event and she well, said she, uh, she did say that what I call the arising of the divine feminine that happened to me this summer, right, that this is a field of the great mother, I'm being held in this field of the great mother. And therefore, I have the strength to face my deepest wounds, tra traumas, uh, to deal with that through images to feel the feelings to be present to what I have shoved down because it was too painful for too many years. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's part of what she said. And uh, for me, this kind of began in December, uh, December 30th, 2018, when I had a big dream of an androgynous figure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this summer, when I had an experience of the divine feminine, I, kind of asked myself, you know, is this the feminine element of that androgynous figure? And as soon as I thought that, I had this experience of the divine feminine that was, for me, beauty at the highest possible level, you can imagine. Right. And so that was a numinous experience for you. Yes, very much It was much come so. through. And interestingly, uh, uh, Winston's mom and Jaguar Force here have uh, started to talk about this, and uh, Jaguar Focus says, uh, no guy can uh, be whole till they integrate the feminine aspect of themselves. I wish I had known this stuff when I was in my 20s. Winston's mom says, life would have been much easier. One would assume Jaguar Focus, I discovered this only two years ago, and I'm approximately 352 months of age. Jaguar Focus says uh, empathy is the most humane quality in people, even if they might not be very compassionate. People with empathy ha uh, just have a more spacious presence. And then Brother Francis says, uh, for, inter for interpretation, Mary Magdalene, divine feminine, Gospel, Megan, uh, someone on Audible, Mary Magdalene Revealed, I think it is called. Um, and Winston's mom says, typo, 720 months is what she meant. I, I am oldish. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I probably have you, <laughs> Winston's mom. But anyway, anyway. Um, you know, obviously we do have to in integrate the feminine and the feminine has, has been coming through more and more um, insistently and forcefully over the last uh, time, especially since World War II. I mean, since um, Rosie the Riveter and when women 
had to go and and uh, keep the factories going and actually build the Liberty ships and the and the tanks. Um, you know, men had to start to think of women in a different way. I mean, actually, they had from the time of Susan B. Anthony in the United States, but. Um, Susan B. Anthony once commented in, I think in 1905, that um, people were throwing roses up on the stage where she was speaking. And she said, well, 40 years ago, they were, weren't throwing roses <laughs> when she started, when she was, which was in the uh, 1860s or something. Um, when she started her campaign. And of course, uh, the Seneca Convention happened in 1848. So, so in the US, the feminine principle has been pressing through with, with a lot of resistance uh, from the masculine principle. But, you know, I find uh, people that are displaying hyper -ma masculinity to me really turn me off like this this fellow who has uh, got the national car rental ad and, you know, he's always overemphasizing his masculine voice and his manliness. And I go, oh my God, you know, why don't they get rid of this guy? Because he doesn't represent American men that well to me anyway. I don't think he does. And uh, anyway. The feminine is definitely pushing through in my life all the time. Um, so let's. So Anthony says, uh, I literally have, I literally have had two conversations about integrating the anima feminine aspects of man and how I've been partly manifesting it by growing my hair long to eventually donate it. Uh, in the last two days, I hope I was able to articulate my reasoning to them whether or not they're open-minded enough to accept it as another. Um, and uh, the next era is going to be determined by how well men and women do not other themselves from each other. Um, yeah. Okay. And, uh, anyway, any more comments? Um, Tim, did you have you ever uh, made peace with the anima, with your muse there? Sorry. Um, no, she just continues to disturb me, and <laughs> uh, I feel like it's it's kind of like Miles was saying you know, you, you get saved and you think that's it, but then the next day you have a new problem. And, <laughs> and so the feminine is always trying to break through in new ways. Right. And as I've mentioned to some of you, my studio is carved out of a, what was built as a home for wayward women back in the 1890s. Right. And I think the spirits in the, this building are always pestering me and keeping me on my toes. So I think it's going to probably continue. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm finding that myself, um, although I'm, I'm arm wrestling, <laughs> forever arm wrestling. <laughs> uh, um, some, someday I might tell some of you uh, what's been going on lately, but we'll see. Uh, that will be in the advanced reading <laughs> <laughs> it's group. Uh, so anyway, um, Anthony Roberts says there's a channel called Uberboya. I think you will really enjoy. Yes, Uberboyo, I have been well aware of for a couple of years now, and um, I love those guys. They're terrific. And uh, uh, if you want to see my interview with Uber Boyo, uh, you can on the home page of this channel, just go into then do a search inside my channel, just put Uber Boyo in and you will find my interview with Uber Boyo.
Do, does any of this group know Uber Boya? You don't. Uh, I, I highly... Yeah, I've I've seen some. They're very interesting young fellows. Uh, yeah, got their edgy. Well, they're they're um, they're very young and energetic. Uh, well, not that they're not very young. They're both uh, one of them, Stefan uh, Fox, is uh, about thirty, I think, and uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy. I don't remember his last name, but Jimmy Boyo uh, is, uh, I think, in his early early twenties, uh, like 23, 24. He's a PhD student, uh, but they're very much into um, into Jungian psychology, and they did a very interesting young person's take on um, Ion. And I urge you to take a look at some of their work. It's it's just really special, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's not aimed at my generation, but, but I love it. <laughs> and and uh, for for the younger generation, it's just phenomenal material mm. the way they go about it. Well, their reaction is just priceless as they go through these Jungian terms, like <gasps> you know, for the first time, and they're going, "What is he saying?" You know, right. it's just—it's absolutely priceless to see. Yeah, that, so. and uh, so if you, uh, so anyway, you can look up Uber Boyo as uh, Winston's mom has put it in here. Uh, uh, since we're giving plugs. I would like to recommend if anybody has the time to check out Paul Vanderclay's video today with a uh -huh. gentleman named Bob. And mm -hmm. the title of uh, this interview is, I believe it's Christianity versus non-duality. And, and this Bob really presents some serious challenges to Paul Vanderclay. Uh, oh. But I see myself and I would think it'd be interesting if anyone wants to comment. Um, I see Young as as a, a bridge in between, or he, Young goes up the middle. I don't know how to express it, perhaps, but mm -hmm. I don't think either of them are, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, incorporating uh, the the concepts that Young is presenting in his collected works. Well, I think Paul is coming along. Um, yes. I, I I definitely see signs of, uh, of Paul coming along since he started to get exposed first to Jordan Peterson and then to me. <laughs> and uh, he, he's, uh, I, I really like Paul Vanderclay and I think he's uh, doing an amazing job, honestly. Um, well, they're, they're arguing between essentially uh, Gunas Mundus and and non-duality, or, or rather, they're they're arguing uh, Unus Mundus is what Bob's perhaps saying is is his focus. Um, however, there is always duality. It's it's a, it's the argument of is it a wave or is it a particle? Is it is there duality or non-duality? You know, it's depending on whether you're observing it or not, perhaps. Yeah. It's something like that, and that's why I find this this article very interesting. Uh, let's see, somebody. Uh, uh, so Winston's mom somehow you got moderated, but uh, well, thanks, thanks, Miles, for that uh, tip. I'll go watch that because yeah, the non-duality is more of the Taoist uh, aspect and kind of what we're talking about. It's just the oneness and being in the Floroa. And then I guess the counter position is when you find yourself in the, the duality back and forth, you know, you're mm -hmm. split. And so it's kind of a, a toss of which way do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Anthony Roberts says that Paul Vanderclay and Uber Boyo have an interview in the works. That would be great well, to hear. Yeah hear them talk, that would be great. I'll have to be, watch that. I mean, I do follow Paul's uh, channel and I listen to as much as I can, but uh, he, uh, 
he he blame says that I produce more videos than he does, but no, nobody can keep up with Paul. Um, anyway, um, info says, would you agree that men and women are made for each other and need each other? I think this is quite evident by the male and female anatomy. Well, yeah, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, Brother Francis says, thank you to Winston's mom about Christianity versus non-duality. I can't afford all these books. Well, a lot of these books are online uh, and on uh, YouTube. Um, Google videos on YouTube, Brother Francis, you can listen to the books in reading groups for free, or the library has audiobooks, yes. Um, right, okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Anybody else want to have anything more to say? I just have a quick comment to make. It's sort of this, you know, whether we're going to you know, perpetually talk about duality or non-duality, it's really okay. Uh, the word that in the quote that Nancy provided us today is the ineffable, right? The, and it's, I think we have to ask ourselves, maybe we need to sort of accept the ineffable, ineffable, am I saying that right? Ineffable yeah. and get on with um, making this a better planet. You know, uh, the application and your political psychology, I'll put a plug in for your political psychology, <laughs> is, is, is okay. You know, let's move on from the ineffable and let's do something here to improve this planet. Well, one thing that will improve it, Miles, is if religions stop fighting with one another and start working together to make a, a better species of the human race. And that's been one of my objectives all along. Um, and uh, Winston's mom says, Project Gutenberg has an enormous free library. Also, thank you, Skip and you know, group for the pleasant and interesting evening. And thank you. And I've been trying to make readings available and have, of course, as you know, um, and uh, the latest one that I have been reading on the political psychology channel is this one, which is Amer uh, America on the Couch um, by Pythia Pei. And Pythia, uh, interestingly, Pythia is the name of the Oracle of Delphi. And Pythia has been a personal friend of mine for about five years now. And she did this a book. She actually wrote two books simultaneously and published them simultaneously a couple years back. But uh, this one is um, interviews with all kinds of prominent union analysts. And uh, so I read the first one, um, it, which is Donald Kalshut's uh, interview um, onto the YouTube channel. The political psychology YouTube channel um, a little uh, yesterday, I think it was, and I'm planning to do more. Um, let's see. I guess I don't have handy the, the link for the political psychology page, but if you're interested in that sort of thing, there's lots more there. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, I'll see you most of you on Wednesday. What I expect is that uh, we, we're going to have two more sessions before Christmas. Um, and so I hope to get through this essay before Christmas and uh, there will not be a class or a group between Christmas and New Year's because I'm going to travel and I won't be back and available on that Monday. Um, but, and the advanced reading group probably has two more classes this Wednesday and next Wednesday, but then the next two Wednesdays are in fact Christmas and New Year's, so those will be holidays. Uh, 
So uh, thank you for joining me this evening and uh, see you soon. Take care now. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot.